Only people who want to practice socialism is black folk. We want to be able to look about civil rights and social integration. And so capitalism means owning and controlling those resources. And that's what I, my powernomic stuff is about. We're going to learn how to own and control resources and power and wealth to take care of our own people. And I guarantee you, from all my years in running campaigns, every politician would knock down anything to get to your door. You can deliver and become a powerful, the most powerful people in this country if you started voting as an independent bloc. They said we move as a group. We move as a fist rather than fingers. And we'll stay together and we'll take care of each other, we'll buy from each other, we'll support each other, and we'll look after each other. And we'll make our dollars bounce in our community on that first floor. We'll make it circulate eight to 12 times before it leaves black hands. You're powerless. They know the only thing you're going to do, they shoot 20 blacks tomorrow. The only thing you're going to do is go out and march. That's all you're going to do. They know that. You have no power and wealth. Why don't black folk say our exceptionality is that we are different from all these groups you're trying to put us into? So how can you let somebody put you in a bag with all these other groups when they don't have the experiences you have and have been treated the way you've been treated? At some point, your exceptionality should be brought up and should be dignified that you were the first in all these things. You were the first people. You were the first Jews. You were the first human beings on earth. You're different. Exceptionality. And I want you to start all these marches that you have, I want you to start marching towards exceptionality. And so we're going to get into that. But first, let me say, I, I don't want to deviate from what is customary that I do whenever I come to one of these occasions. That is to try to give you a status report on black people in America. And let me tell you up front, you are not progressing. I've been telling you that now for 25 to 30 years, even when I was with the Carter administration going around the country. You're not going to progress. You're going backwards. You're going backwards. The only people in blacks in America are progressing are those who are locked into a vein called entertainers. If you're an entertainer, what you're telling white folk is that you are safe as a, as a birth control pill. There ain't nothing going to happen. You're not going to do anything for black folk. If you're running with a ball, joking, telling jokes, singing, dancing, or they, that's safe. White folk, that doesn't frighten white folk. They'll give you a television show. They'll put you on 10 television shows. They'll make you a host of a television show. They'll let you broadcast every sport event. As long as you don't address any issues dealing with black folk and the problems that black folk have. And so, you, and, and so when you all see all these blacks on television, read about them in the newspaper, those blacks have been classified as being as 20 times safer than the birth control pill. There ain't nothing going to happen for black folk. And so this morning, I will let you know that you are not progressing. You're not progressing. And first and foremostly, social integration has failed. Get that through your head. Social integration has failed. As a matter of fact, you lost in social ways. You didn't gain anything. You lost everything you had. Any black person here in this auditorium today that's more than 50 years of age can tell you what you used to have. You have nothing now. You used to have theaters and bus companies, cab companies. You used to have almost everything that whites had. But now you have nothing. Why? Because see, social integration is a, is a weakening process. It is not designed to empower you. Power numbers might be, but social integration is not. You cannot integrate anything by, you cannot empower anything by integrating it. You weaken it. And in social integration in this country, what social integration did was make you a guest. You became a guest in what other people own and control. And any of you know that once your guest has been with you for two or three days, you want to get rid of them. <laughs> we are guests. You don't own any hotels. You don't own anything of value in the country. That's why everybody's been pu pushing social integration. That's why you no longer have communities. You used to have decent communities in every black city in America. I used to be able to go to any city and find a black neighborhood, uh, not a neighborhood, those neighborhoods, communities. You used to have some of the finest communities in America right here in LA. You had a Compton, you had an Inglewood, you had a Watts, you had a South Central, you had something. You got nothing now. And all my blacks who were so silly enough, they moved out of the city up into the mountains and said, I'm getting away from all of I'm gonna go up in the mountain by myself. And you turn over the city to the people you're competing against. Social integration cannot enhance you. Now, anybody in social economics knows this. The Jews found this out way back a long time ago, in the 1500s, in, in Europe, when Jews tried to socially integrate. 
And Jews found out very quickly, it is a weakening process. They became at risk. No group is going to try to social integrate that's an out group. And especially if you're an out group, that's a hated group. You are a hated out group. You've always been a hated out group. And then why would you go divide yourself up, splinter yourself, and then scatter yourselves and think that somehow you're progressing? And see, that's why you don't see any other group in this country trying to socially integrate except black folk. You have not seen any integration marches from the Asians. What Asians have been trying to socially integrate? What Arabs have been trying to integrate? What American Indians are coming off the reservations trying to integrate? Nobody wants to integrate but black folk. That is a form of ex social economic suicide. But we do it. You be, and they've been doing it now for all these years. And back during the 1960s, I told them all, you're going the wrong way. You're going the wrong way. Pushing social integration in this country. I'm saying you're going the wrong way. They said, well, Dr. Elson, you're a radical. I don't mind being a radical. Because, see, radical is just the opposite of superficial. If you're superficial means you're just dealing with anything minute, not irrelevant, wheel spinning, non-frictional kind of activities. Radical means you got a problem that's very desperately bad. And you got to do that's what you call radical surgery. You got to cut something out and stop, stop it. And so when people call me a radical, I say, fine. And so I don't mind being a radical. Just like somebody was telling me, I don't mind being a racist. A racist signifies power, which I'm going to talk about a few minutes ago. People say, you're a racist? I would love to be a racist so I can have some power. But anyway, so social integration just, just cut us down. And in terms of what, what it's done to us, your poverty rate, your poverty rate didn't, hasn't improved. It hasn't improved. Right now, 38% to almost 40% of all the black people in America are beneath the poverty line. Almost 40% of all the blacks in America beneath the poverty line. You've got about another 33% that's right on the border of going into the poverty category. If you were to take away their house, a little bit of money, an investment, a little bit of money in a car, they go beneath the poverty line. And then you would have two-thirds of all the blacks in America would be poverty-stricken. Now, black children right now across America, about 35% of all black children are in poverty. The wealth gap is also decreasing. The gap, wealth gap between whites and blacks is decreasing. About 1985, when Ronald Reagan came into office, in about the third year he'd been in office, guess what? The gap jumped up three times, where we, where we picked up something like about over 300, 300 percent increase in whites in America, became millionaires and billionaires in a three-year period between 1982 and 1986. And at the same time, the gap between poor blacks and middle-class blacks began to widen. You're not getting any better. In slavery, you had one half of one percent of the wealth. And we only had 200 some thousand blacks that were free out of four and a half million. And here you are 150 years later in the richest country on earth. And you still own one half of one percent after 150 years. And everybody will run their mouth about, we're progressive. Watch all these civil rights leaders talk that crap. <laughs> How we're progressive. Where are you progressive? Show it to me. Show me the progress. You haven't got a pot <laughs> or a window to throw it out of. And talking about we're progressing. They look through the mirror of a car and, look, and, and, and see, uh, looking in the reverse, they think they're going in reverse, but they, in fact, they have been in reverse. We're not progressing in this country, we're going backwards. Right now, the unemployment rate has not changed. What you're hearing now in the news about, well, the economy is getting better. They are not talking about black folk when they talk about the economy improving. I don't care whether you got an economic boom or depression or recession. Black folk are outside and underneath the economy. It doesn't make any difference. Nothing's going to change for you. Now I hear a lot of my civil rights leaders say, but you here, Dr. Anderson, but a rising tide will lift all boats. Yeah, fool, they have to accept the boat that's got a hole in it and it's concreted to the bottom. <laughs> it's going to stay underneath the water. And so, the, so what happens, our unemployment rate even when Obama came to office, nationally, it was 35%. In Detroit, Michigan, it was 48%. In Baltimore, it was 48% also. And in Pittsburgh, 49%. In New York, 52% for black folk. Over half of the black folk in America right now are unemployed. They're not going to tell you that. It's called a structural unemployment rate. See, the only people reporting as being unemployed are those who are either searching for, searching for a job in the job market or they're collecting unemployment compensation. 
The rest of them have dropped out of the system. They're sitting on the corner someplace. Some place in this town I can go find them, sit down on the curb, laying in the alleys, sleeping in garages. They're no longer looking for jobs. The unemployment rate is not changing. It's staying the same and getting worse. The same thing also happened in terms of uh, 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 things like imprisonment. You're in prison and the blacks are still going to prison in massive, in massive numbers. You came out of slavery. Over 50% of all the black people in, who were free in 1860 on the eve of the Civil War, it, in prison, there was somewhere around 50% of all prisoners in the United States, in Atlanta, Savannah, New York, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, Buffalo. Over 50% of all the prisoners were blacks, and you only had about 207,000 blacks who were free. Yet you made up over 50% of all the prisoners. You now still make up over 51% of all the prisoners in the United States. So you're not progressing any place. Now all this means what to us? It means that black folk don't have the wherewithal to be a competitive people. What you, to be a competitive people, the first thing you must do is have some wealth. You must have some wealth. And you came out of slavery in 1860, you had one half of one percent of the nation's wealth, the richest nation on the earth. You still have one half of one percent. It is wealth power, wealth power that dictates your opportunities in our society. It is wealth power that teaches you what you can do and what you can't do. Forget about civil rights and social integration. You try going down to the Ritz call tonight and tell them, I want one of those $1,000 room nights, uh, one of those hotel rooms tonight. Give me a $1,000 room. And I want lobster and, and everything, every 20 minutes of steaks, filet mignons. And they say, how are you going to pay for it? They say, I'm going to pay for it through civil rights and social integration. <laughs> and they'll probably throw you off the top floor of the building. <laughs> what decides your opportunity in the society is what you own and control. That's the bottom line of it. Now, what's happening in all the urban cities across America is that you've got a process in, in place right now in urban re in re redevelopment. They're using five techniques that to totally wipe you out. One is called gentrification. They're going into all these major cities that used to be majority black population, populated cities, and they, they are erasing you in, in places like Detroit, Michigan, New York, Boston, Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. used to be the chocolate city. When I went there with President Carter in 1976, at that time Washington D.C. was 78% black. Now it's down to about 42% black. Wow. Chocolate City is gone. <laughs> Detroit, Michigan is going to be totally wiped out by immigrants pouring into the society. In 19, since 1970 up to now, we've had 45 million immigrants come into the United States. They came in over you, and they're displacing you. And then the second term they use besides gentrification to wipe you out is a thing they call privatization. You go into Detroit, Michigan, as they gentrify, they're going to take all the public resources and things that should be owned by the public, they're going to place them through privatization to the hands of the wealthy whites. Whites are going to buy your golf courses, your subway systems, your bridges, your tunnels. They're going to control your airports, your parks, your museums. Why? Again, because Anderson says, he who owns and controls the resources got the power. If you own and control nothing, you are totally, absolutely useless and expendable. And, so, and, what, and that's why we have, nothing has changed for us, because we don't understand the system of gentrification and privatization. The other thing they're using to wipe you out in those cities is called metropolitan forms of government. We're now going to do regional form of government, which means that the whites in the suburbs can come into those black cities and set up some kind of a consortium to control what goes on inside those cities so they can take the, extract the resources out of them. Another concept they use in those cities is called cool cities, which says cool cities means bring in the gays and let them replace black folk. And, so, and that, that's, the, that's the fourth scheme they use on you. And in Detroit, Michigan, using that as an example again, the governor there, has already set up a, in movement a system where he wants to go, into, go to the President of the United States, Obama, and ask him for a green card system where he can start importing Chinese from China to make, make Detroit, Michigan the biggest Chinatown in the United States. 
even though that city had a 90% black population. They're going to bury blacks in Detroit, Michigan, underneath Asians coming into Detroit. And already in Detroit, Michigan, in Dearborn, right on the outskirts of Detroit, Arabs own 90%. 90% of all the businesses in the city of Detroit are owned by Arabs. Arabs and 90% black population must go to a 90, must go to the Arabs to get what they want in terms of food, medicine, clothing, because they own all the, they own out of the gas stations. You got 146 gas stations in Detroit, Michigan. Arabs now own 144 in a black city. Blacks own two gas stations out of 146. You own nothing. The rest, the hotels, are, are owned, and the 7-Elevens are owned by Indians. Asians are owning the, the, the laundries. The laundries. They're owning the hair and wig shops, the nail shops. Blacks own nothing in a 90% black city. And that's why now Detroit went into poverty. That's why it was declared bankrupt. Because blacks had money. They, blacks had about, a, about 11 or 12 million, billion dollar a year annual disposable uh, amount of money passing through their hands. They were going out to the suburbs, spending it in the suburbs, and spending it with the Arabs and the Asians, the Hispanics, and everybody else. And when I tried to put in a plan there for black folk, they said it was racist for me to try to help black folk. They said, yes, Dr. Anderson, we admit in this town that we have, a, we have an Asian town, a China town, a Pole town, a hockey town, a Cork town a Mexican town and a Greek town, but it's racist for you to try to do something for black folk, to build a black town. And guess what the black leadership said? They show sure is right. <laughs> and if you want to find out if I'm telling a lie or not, you got blacks sitting right in this, in this auditorium that was there. You got right here on the front row, two here, you got Rosie Milligan that was there and spoke in Detroit. And I had over a thousand blacks come across America and say, we will move and relocate our business to Detroit to build a black community, a black business district. We'll move our businesses into Detroit, over a thousand of them. And guess what? The town got scared and fighting. And they, and they, and they sold up, told black folk, no, we don't, uh, it's racist to, to, for, for, for Anderson to come in and not include everybody and everything. And so that ended that effort. And so that's why Detroit failed. So what I'm saying to you is anything that's happened to black folk in this country is can continue to happen, but it is not by accident. You all have to understand today that you are locked into a social construct. That social construct was put in place <laughs> almost 300 and 400 years ago. You are locked and boxed. You're locked and boxed. Now, here's what I'm going to tell you that nobody else tells you. You're locked and boxed because of the United States Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the Declaration of Independence. You're locked and boxed. We got black leaders can't figure that out. You go read the Constitution, it tells you straight up front what's going to happen to black folk. You're locked into it. That is a social construct that says in this country, in this country, that in the Constitution, which was approved in 1789, it says that this is a white nation. The first immigration law in, 19, in 1791, spell it out. It's a, it is a white nation for white Europeans and other white people classified as white. And black folk are now going to be a permanent underclass. Not a permanent class, they will be an underclass. You will be classified as three-fifths of a human being. You will be classified as property. You will be classified as property and three-fifths of a human being. You will not be permitted to do things that everybody else could be permitted to do. And in the Constitution, it's spelled out and black folk don't know this. The people in New York, in, in Philadelphia, met for a whole week. They closed all the windows and all the doors and put up guards as they, when they drafted the Constitution and said, don't let anybody in. We don't want anybody to hear this. We got to decide how are we going to enslave all these black folk and use them without the public knowing it. While we craft a document that says all people are free, we're going to enslave these. That was done a week before the Constitutional Convention started in the 17, late 1700s. And what they decided to do, and all of them participated, including Jefferson and Madison and all of them, they wrote up the Constitution, was this. They said, whenever we talk in those documents about all the people, we are not talking about black folk. When they say, we the people, that's white folk. All the people, that's white folk. When you talk, when you talk about the black people, you use very broad and ambiguous terms that nobody can understand. They develop a code into the construct. The code was those people against blacks. 
Those who are abundant, black folk. Those who are indebted, black folk. They're unhappy lot, black folk. And you look at those documents, whenever they use those terms, they were talking about black people. Whenever you use the very specific terms, like we the people, all the people, you're talking about white people. And so when you read the document, it says that, in this, that, that all, all people have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of what? That's a lie. It wasn't happiness. It was property. It was property, and they, and they, and they changed it in the second writing. They demanded that it be changed from, 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 from property because black folk were their property. They were coming pursuing black folk. And they changed it and put in happiness. Anybody that got past a third grade education would have figured that out and say, well, hold a second. White folk aren't that dumb. Why would white folk go across the Atlantic Ocean on a three-month voyage at the risk of their lives to come to the United States looking for happiness? They didn't come here looking for happiness. They came here looking for what they call the American dream. And so what I'm going to talk about now is to clear up all the debris and all the garbage because you all cannot save yourselves unless you get rid of all the garbage off the table, get rid of all the trash. And when they start talking about, about the American dream, the American dream did not include you. The American dream was two things. It was coming to America, getting free land and free black labor. That was the American dream, to come to America and get unearned benefits if you were an immigrant. The person that couldn't come was black folk, and they put a zero quota on black folk coming. And when you hear these people bragging about the American dream, don't be misled. They're not talking about you. You were the part of the dream. You can't get it because you were part of it. And all these people coming to America right now, they're still coming here talking about the American dream. Now, even though they can't get the, the uh, free land anymore, or not all the free, la free um, labor, they are coming here getting those free, unearned benefits. Slavery was unearned benefits. Whites didn't have to work to get benefits during slavery. All they had to do was own a black person, a home black folk, and get free benefits. That's why when slavery ended, they created Wall Street, where now you can go invest in stocks and get unearned benefits. 87% of all the money in the country that's generated, that people live off, whites live off in this country, comes from unearned labor. They don't work for it. They push paper around and numbers around and get 87% of the wealth in the nation. Wall Street replaced it the back of a black slave. That's what, that's, that's what unearned benefits mean when they start talking about how did you get your wealth and power. 87% of what whites get every year for earnings, they get it from unearned benefits such as stocks in a company, stocks on Wall Street, stock equity in a corporation. They get it from rental income. They get it from tax uh, refund, dividends, all kind of abatements. They get that free. They don't earn it. But they want black folk to go out and work and sweat and earn your income, talking about you can't get the free welfare food stamps, where they get all the benefits that are unearned. And so consequently, let's, let, you won't, you know, unless you understand these things, we can't make it. Now let me get rid of some of the debris before I get into what I'm going to talk about today. I didn't get into it yet. Let me take, make sure y'all understand this. The first thing you have to understand before you can get, do some serious stuff in this country and in this city, understand what racism is. Racism is not what you've been hearing all these years about racism is whether or not you like somebody, whether or not you can get along with them, whether or not you're prejudiced, bigoted, or, or biased. That has nothing in the world to do with racism. Please stop your friends from getting in your ear talking about racism because you don't like somebody, or because he said something to you individually, or because he fired this black person. That is not racism. Racism is a group concept. Racism does not exist unless you're dealing on a group-to-group -group basis. You cannot have racism on a group to an individual basis. It doesn't exist. Nobody can, a white person can't do anything to me personally based on racism. It has to be against my group. He can personally be against me for personal reasons, but his personal preference or his personal bias or his personal bigotry, that is not racism. Racism is a group funds concept. Secondly, it is based on economics. It's an economics that has nothing to do with social. Racism never existed on this earth until the 15, early 1500s, about 1503. And it came out as a direct result because uh, of, of blacks being enslaved. See, back about, about 1442, as an example, you had Henry the Navigator that went around the coast of Africa. 
and got and pulled, pulled up about 16 blacks and took them back to Italy and gave them to the Pope as slaves. The Pope then in, put in, in about 1442, used those blacks in the Pope's residence and, and in the Vatican. Says, boy, it's good to have some black slaves around here. If anybody wants to, wants to have some free labor, get yourself some black slaves. Now, here come Columbus a few years later and supposedly discovered America. When he discovered America and went back to Europe, and, that, and when he went back to Europe in the early 1500s, Europe was being wiped out. They were suffering from all kinds of kind, uh, diseases, famine, starvation, crime. Europe was in, a it was in the bottom. Europe was getting wiped totally out from diseases, food, famines, and everything, disease, everything else you can think of. And they said, we've got to do something to build, rebuild the European continent. And somebody says, well, look, Columbus just discovered America. He got all these, and, and, and got all that free land over there. And if now we, got, and we found out we, got, we can use black labor. Why don't we, come up, why don't we uh, uh, start using these blacks to build wealth and power in North America, Central America, and South America? And when they did that, nine nations said, that's a good idea. And, now they, and, that, and when they said that, all of them got into a contest, a race, to, to, get, to try to get to America, to develop it for wealth. They got into a contest. The nations started competing for wealth. And that's where the racism came from. Racism then, these nations were re trying to pick up different parts of the Americas and use black labor to really be able to build wealth and power for their home nations. That is racism. It is, and it was based on economics. It started about, 15, about 1503. Now, I want you to understand what racism is. It is a competitive relationship between groups of people that are competing for the ownership and control of resources, wealth, and power. That is racism. Again, make sure you understand it. Racism is a group-based phenomenon. It's economic-based. It's when groups are competing for the ownership and control of resources, power, and wealth, and to be able to use it to benefit their people. And once they get enough of it, then they can shut somebody else down. They can enslave another group, Jim Crow segregate them, or do anything they want to them. That is racism. No black person can be a racist. It is impossible in theory and practice for a black person to be a racist in America. You cannot be. There's no way you can be. And quit letting people call you a racist because you speak up for your own people. You can't be a racist. Where do you have enough power and wealth and resources to tell white folk who they can marry, where they can live, and what businesses they can own and control? No black person can do that. This is what Dr. Answer, we got some, with Malcolm X and, and, and Farquhar and what they're racist. No, they weren't racist. Any black person that speaks out in behalf of his own people is not a racist. He is reacting to white racism. All a black person can do is to react to white racism. He cannot be a racist. That's why I get very concerned. I hear people talking about, well, Dr. Answer, ooh, we got reverse racism. Yeah, how do you get reverse racism? Well, he, he's talking bad about us. He's supposed to. He's reacting to what you're doing to him. You're about beating a man to death and talking about, well, he doesn't want me to beat him anymore. He's a real racist. Well, well it's a reverse discrimination. And how to get to be reverse discrimination? Well, 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 well you, you can't, let me, let me tell you something. You cannot have reverse discrimination unless you got forward discrimination. If I pull a car into a garage, in front of the garage, and park the car on your foot, And while the car is in forward gear, and I start screaming in pain, he said, get it off my foot. They said, well, Dr. Essa, for me to put it in reverse and back it up, that, that, that's reverse backup, but that's reverse discrimination. So it's best for us to leave it where it is on your foot. <laughs> it's stupid stuff. But black folk go along with it, you see? Well, uh, Dr. Essa, we won't be caught being, be talking about reverse discrimination. Hell, if he's on your foot, you get it off. I don't care what you call it, but my people are scared. They'll tell me, well, wait, well, I might as well let it stay on there, child. It'll be okay. God will make a way. <laughs> Y'all understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And so, and they, they're scared to stand up and say, no. <laughs> and so, and, and, and so what they've done now is set up a social construct and locked you into being three-fifths of a human being and being property. Now, and, and guess what? Then they wrote the Constitution. No black leaders make this point. 
the first, con we got two constitutions in the United States. We got the first one that was written and codified in 1789, and we got another one in the 1860s. The first constitution was an affirmative action plan. It is an affirmative action plan for whites. And you hear white folks always talking about they're against affirmative action plans. They're only against affirmative action plan for you. Why? You see, because I wrote the other affirmative action plan, I wrote it in 1970 when I was over state the education system for Florida. I did not write an affirmative action plan for everybody. I wrote that plan for black people. I did not write that plan for minorities and poor folk and people of color, midgets, humpback, lesbians. I wrote it for black folk. Yeah. <laughs> Why? Because, see, affirmative action was supposed to be corrective action, correcting something that the system and that the government has done consciously, historically, and continuously against a very specific group of people. That's what affirmative action is. Then why in the world do you all keep letting people put you in a bag called minority? No government hasn't, hasn't done anything in the minorities. Why are you letting them put, and put in there comparing you and equating you to gays? And, well, now they're getting all the benefits. And Hispanics, Hispanics weren't even in the country. And now when you go to affirmative action plan, guess what? I got Eskimos in the affirmative action plan. <laughs> when did Eskimos pick cotton? They had nothing in the world to do with affirmative action. The government hadn't done anything to them. And you go into an affirmative action program, the affirmative action program had been totally corrupted. The only people that should have been on the affirmative action plan in the first place were black folk. Because those are the only people that the government done some things to specifically exploit, misuse, abuse, subordinate, enslave, Jim Crow segregate, castrate, lynch, and, do it and deny them education. Only black people. And you got to go look at the affirmative action plan that got everything in there except your dog from the neighbor's yard. <laughs> and I don't see any blacks speaking up about it. They'll go right down and call, well, I'm a minority. How the hell you get to be a minority? What's a minority? I don't know what it is, Dr. Ennis, but I know I'm one. Because <laughs> they call me one. <laughs> and, I'm, and then leaving that point, I'm telling you, it is illegal and unconstitutional. For, for you to equate anything to black folk in this country and make them equal. There is no constitutional basis to have any Asians, Arabs, Hispanics, women, gays in affirmative action programs or preferential programs. It is legal, legal. but I haven't seen one black person, not one black person, go to court and raise hell about it. As a matter of fact, I have whites that tell me that they were totally, absolutely surprised that they started doing that, that no blacks spoke up and raised cane about it. They just sat there and let it go down. That's why back in 1970, with the affirmative action plan, and when I wrote that plan, they turned around immediately and came up with a thing called Title IX. Because throughout history, every time you try to do something for black folk, they would throw other groups in there to water it down and dilute it and give it to everybody so blacks wouldn't be anything left for black folk. Yeah. And they come up with Title IX. How are you going to spend those money now since we are for black people and they got, got Title IX? Every county, all 67 of the letter back says, any money comes out here, we're giving it to women. Now the penny would go to black folk. No black folk raised cane. None of them said anything. They went down like that. That's what happened to your money. Because you see, and, it, and guess what it's backed by? It's backed by the United States Supreme Court. One of the most racist organizations in America. One of the most racist institutions in America is the United States Supreme Court. And I still cease with a total, absolute amazement as to why black folk keep going to the court system. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. The deck is stacked by the United States Supreme Court. The United States Supreme Court has never, 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 never ever done anything and benefit black folk. Never. And they are going to do it. You've had the first 57 to 58 people appointed as justice to the United States Supreme Court were slave owners. And everything subsequent to the 1860s, they were either white racists or people who were totally indifferent to black folk. They're one of those two even to the present time. They're either racist, closet racist, or they're totally indifferent to black folk. They don't care about black folk. And what they've done is to make sure that the social construct 
uh, what was set up in the, in the Constitution about your being property and three-fifths of a human being and non-competitive will stay in existence. The guardians of racism in America is the United States Supreme Court. That's why when the, when the second Constitution was written in the 1860s, and you had a few liberal whites, radical, radical Republicans those days said, we got to correct some of these things that's going on. And they, they crafted the second constitution. The second constitution was made up of the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, and the 15th Amendment. And they also passed two civil rights laws, the 1865 and 1866 civil rights laws. They passed those laws all for black folk, newly freed slaves. They passed them for newly freed slaves. The Supreme Court jumped in immediately. And they used that same little schemes they used today. The first thing they did was said that all those civil rights laws that were passed from 1865 all the way up to the 18, and to the 1880s, late 18, about 1889, all those civil rights laws were unconstitutional. Nobody gave them authority to do that. The United States Supreme Court does not have the authority to do what it's doing to you all right now. It doesn't have, even have the authority. But you don't see any black, you got all these black with law degrees. You, don't, you see one raising hell about it? The United States Supreme Court does not have the authority to mess over you the way they're messing over you. That's why they've never done anything in your favor. They don't have that authority. Congress is the, is the person that sets the rules and law. They are the elected bodies. Nobody elects anybody to the United States Supreme Court. They're the closest thing to royalty in this country, where they get a lifetime job to do nothing but sit there and mess with people based on their own personal prejudices and get away with it because nobody raises cane about it. They don't have the authority. And so, and, and, but they, they, so they, they, they didn't do anything after the Marlboro and Madison case back in 1803. Then here, jump up to 1857, and here comes a case called Dred Scott. In the Dred Scott case, a black man then was trying to get his freedom, having moved, gone from, moved from Missouri to Illinois. And the, and the Supreme Court, it went to the Supreme Court. And, and Justice Taney ruled in that, being the Chief Justice says that in the final ruling in the Dred Scott decision in 1857, it said a black man has no rights that a white man is bound to respect. That case, that issue has never been overruled. Well, are black folk progressing in America? No, you're not progress. That's why they're shooting you down. That's why they're shooting down a black man every other week in some place in the United States or beating a black woman. These are just the police alone. Dragging you out of cars, beating black women on the street, shooting black men. Why? Because the Dred Scott decision is still in effect. It's still in effect. That you have no rights because the decision was never addressed. And the, and the real sadness and irony of this, and I look in the newspaper, I look, in the, look on TV, and here comes my people down the road. Guess what they're doing? Wearing signs, hollering, yelling, screaming, and saying on the signs, Black lives matter. They never ask the question, black lives matter to whom? To whom? I look on TV every day and they are walking with signs, black lives matter. To, they never say, to whom does it matter? You got a law saying you don't matter. And more importantly, if you understand the nature of the system, you would know that you don't matter. Why? Because you see, in American society, and in a capitalistic society, value of life is based on what we call personal net worth. When you go to a bank, the first thing I'm gonna ask you to do is to fill out what? A personal net worth statement. Net worth means what are you worth? That's why you hear people saying all the time, John D. Rockefeller is worth. Henry Ford is worth. Bill Gates is worth. They are telling you that value is, what you're worth is based on what? What you own and control. And since in black folk we only control less than 1% or 2% of anything, that's why whites say we aren't worth two cents. Because we don't control anything. We control less than one and a half or 1%. How in the world can you justify how people been in the country for 500 years and can't even control 1% of something? It's because of the social construct you're locked into. You're locked into it, bottomed up. And how did that come about with capitalism? Let's go back to what I said a few minutes ago. When they decided to build racism in as a, by commercializing black folk into slavery. They commercialized black folk in Europe 
and started that race. And when the race ended, and they, and they maldestroyed all the wealth, they, they took the E off a race and stuck ISM. ISM means is a, is a suffix which says, maintain the prevailing conditions. If whites had used slavery to acquire almost 100% of all this nation's wealth, resource, privileges, controls of all levels of government into the hands of the white society, racism means let nothing change that condition. That's what you're locked into. Racism means as a group phenomenon, whites own and control practically at almost 100% of everything of value in the society. 87% is frozen. 87% of everything in the society that's, that's owned right now by whites is frozen. It is locked into their communities, locked in their businesses, locked in their culture, locked in their neighborhoods, locked in their schools, locked in their churches. 87% is frozen. You can't get it. That means that the average white child, he is now, he can now has an 87% advantage over a black child. Because everything that a white child needs to be successful in this society is in his community, in his church, in his business, in his neighborhood, in his schools, in his family, in his culture. He can get it anytime he wants to. He inherits it. It is passed on from one generation to the next. Every child gets what he needs at birth. Now the disadvantage for these black children is that you have never owned anything and never controlled anything. And what you can pass on is what you cannot inherit. Because you see, all of our black leadership have had us focusing on things that are non-inheritable. You cannot inherit food stamps. You cannot inherit public housing. You can't inherit a job. Every time I go to a civil rights organization, I say, what are you doing to enrich black folk? and give them something to pass on to their children. They say, well, we're going to try to get blacks some jobs. You can, why, how are you going to pass on a job to a black child? Why don't you build some businesses with stock, elder, and wealth and pass that on to them? Yeah. Now, what we're going to do now, we're going to have to change. We're going to have to flip the switch. Flip the switch, power up on the power numbers principles. I'm going to give it to you again. We're going to have to flip the social economic switch and start learning how to power up on the power economics principles. Now, why, how they get away with these things while we can't do anything is because we're not playing the game to win. We're not playing the game to win. The bottom line is this. If you're going to play the game to win, you must understand those power economics principles in those books. The first thing you must do, you're going to have to go vertical, straight up and down. Everything must be vertical because racism is vertical. Racism is not horizontal. It goes from the top to the bottom. Anything that's horizontal, stay away from it. Do not get involved in anything that is horizontal. That's a total, absolute waste of time. I know a lot of my friends want to get involved in, in horizontal issues. Anything that applies to everybody around the world is horizontal. Anything that applies to everybody around the world is horizontal. I got a lot of friends getting involved in religion. Religion is a horizontal issue. Anybody can belong to any religion, any place, any time they want to. That is not a vertical issue. And if you're black and you get involved and your primary issue becomes religion, then what happens is that the only people that benefit is only where those two issues will cross. Where vertical cross the horizontal, those people right behind it would benefit. And that's why I tell people up front, I don't care what religion a black person belongs to. He is my friend and member of my group. I don't get into the religious aspects of anything. I don't care whether you want to be a Mormon or, or, or Hare Krishna or, or you want to practice Hinduism, Buddhism, anything you want. That doesn't about, I don't get into that. Sexism, that is a horizontal issue. I got all these guys always, I didn't want to, I didn't want to fight for women for this around the world. Women in, in Iran can't drive cars. That ain't my problem. <laughs> That's not my problem. And I don't want that to be black folks' problem. That's between her and those people over there. What, how do we, let them resolve that. I want the poorest people in, on the earth to start prioritizing. Quit majoring in the minors, digging in the minutia, getting involved in non-frictional wheel-spinning activities that cannot lift you up. They said, well, Dr. Evans, how about the gays? We got to do something for the gays. That ain't my issue. As far as I'm concerned, the gays can stay in the closet.
You can go back in the closet and lock the door behind you. That's not my problem. I'm not interested, and I'm going to give you my approval to who you want to go to bed with and who you want to screw at night. That's not my issue. Don't equate that, and I'm offended if you equate that to black folk. That is not the same as being black. But so you stay away from those issues and say, no, if that's, if they, they don't have to come out of the closet. Gays should go do what they want to do and do their own thing. But, what they, but they want to come out publicly and want blacks to identify with them and support them. And I got all these liberal and civil rights movements. They can't wait to get involved in the gay issues. From the White House down, that's all they talk about is gayness this, gayness that. Congratulations, you're a transsexual. Who cares? That's not, that's not nothing to do with black folk. The 500 years of suffering that black folk went through was not because of being whether or not they were gay. Some of the biggest slave owners in this country were gays. If I go down to New Orleans right now, you got a restaurant called the Two Sisters Restaurant in New Orleans. The Two Sisters Restaurant is still in existence in New Orleans. That was owned by two gay white women doing slavery. They were the biggest slaveholders in New Orleans, and they were gay. And this restaurant still exists. That has nothing to do with the slaves that were there. Now, people, well, how about women? The same thing, mixing women issues with black issues is like mix, comparing a headache to cancer. It might be a headache being a woman at times, but it's cancerous being black. And a lot of black women can't understand that difference. They'll run out right now and say, I'm going with the sisterhood. I'm going to join all women in the world. And they don't understand that the issue is not with sisterhood of women. It's with the, with the race and particularly with the black man. Racism started out with the black man, not with the black woman. Nobody wanted any black women in America as slaves. Get that through your heads. They didn't need any black women. Black women was too weak and they couldn't do the work. They didn't start importing black women into the United States as slaves until the late, <clears throat> until the late 1700s. You know why? When they found out by the early 18, by the, in, in, during the course of the 1800s, that they were going to that they that they had 20 years in the Constitution from 1789 all the way up to about 1807 that slavery, importing slaves, would end. You remember that? Yes. You could not in, bring in blacks from out of the country. So all of a sudden, whites said, okay, I tell you what, let's do. Since we can't, can't bring in any more slaves in, because the Constitution said they had 25 years from 1709 to bring in slaves, because we end in 1807, let's start now, start breeding our own slaves. And let's take women now and use them as breeders. Yeah. So we can get free slaves off of women. And that's where the whole issue turned to women. But basically, they wanted a black man as strong and big and burly as they can get him and work him to death before he was 35 to 40 years of age. They wanted to work him to death until he died. Because they had no interest in taking care of him, giving him Social Security and medical benefits. <laughs> and so stay away from that issue. The next issue is capitalism. Now, when, slavery, slavery, when racism started in the, in the 1500s and they started practicing racism, guess what happened? Capitalism started. Up to that time, the whole way of making money was mercantilism. And all of a sudden, they started getting these slaves who can generate all this wealth. By wealth, they figured they paid 40, for about 40, about, this is typically about $40 at most for a slave uh, in this country. And I'm sorry, no, they paid about $25 for a slave off the coast of Africa. They spent about $40 to, to work him for a whole year. That's the maximum amount of money he was spent on a slave. That's for his welfare. But they expect that slave to bring in about a 1,500% return for owning him. And so they're going to work him to death. And so they started things saying, so capitalism started. Now, what is capitalism? That started about 1509, about, probably about, about, eight, about seven or eight years after commercialized slavery started in Europe, capitalism started. That's what you're operating under right now is capitalism. Now, what is capitalism? Capitalism means own and control the land, the tool, the resources, and use other people's labor to enrich yourselves. Now, if you all in here, let me repeat it again. Capitalism means own and control the land, the tools, and the resources, and use other people's labor to enrich yourself. That is capitalism. W.B. Du Bois defined capitalism a little different, but pretty close to the same thing in 1915. 
W.B. Du Bois says that capitalism is like having three to four ears of corn. You eat, you save, you sell, and use the other seeds for next year's planting. That is capitalism. Now, how many blacks you know that's eating, saving, and selling, and planting? Did any of you in this, in this auditorium now hear me say anything about that capitalism was social integration and civil rights? No. Then why do you keep practicing capitalism in a capitalist society looking for civil rights and social integration? You're at odds with the society you live in. You're at odds with it. You're swimming upstream. You're swimming upstream. You keep talking about socialism in a, in a capitalist society. Nobody else cares, is concerned about it. Even China and Russia now has become capitalistic. They're not trying to be socialistic anymore. They're looking for wealth and power and resources. Only people who want to practice socialism is black folk. We want to be able to look about civil rights and social integration. And so capitalism means owning and controlling those resources. And that's what I, my power economic stuff is about. We're going to learn how to own and control resources and power and wealth to take care of our own people. Immigration. Also understand immigration. That immigration is not your friend. In, 18, in 1791, in the first immigration law and naturalization law, it stipulated that this is an immigrant nation and, and there can be no black immigrants. That only Europeans can come here to be a white nation. That is, and the black people then are the only people in America that are non-immigrants. I'm telling you this so now when you start watching these politicians, they keep talking about what they're doing for immigrants. Immigrants are coming to this country to replace you to supplant you, to get over you. They're not coming here to be your friend. You're looking for love in all the wrong places. <laughs> They're not coming here to get along with you. They're coming here to get over you and above you and take you out. The National Hispanic Party told me that back in 1972 when they met out here in Kansas City. When one of my friends who has been with the Bay of Pigs from Cuba told me, he said, Dr. Anderson, he says, we're going to dominate starting about the year 2000. We're going to take black folk out. We're going to become the number one minority in this country because black folk don't understand the issues. And they hit it right on the head. You are no longer number two in this country. You're now number three. They passed you in population. And in about another 15 or 20 years, you're going to move from where you are now. You were the number two population for almost 300, 400 years. Hispanics made you number three, uh, third class citizens. And when these Arabs and Asians get together, you're going to become fourth-class citizens because they're going, to, they're going to dominate and dictate over you. And that's why the Hispanic says that anything from now on in this country must come through them first before it goes to black folk. And you, but yet you got all your leadership, all your political leadership, all your civil rights leaders are always talking about, we are people of color. Who are you talking about? Well, those are our brothers. No, they are not. Hispanics were classified as whites up to 1970. In the country right now, 99 and 7 tenths of 1 percent, only 3 tenths of 1 percent of people who speak Spanish in the United States are black. The other 99 and 7 tenths are whites speaking Spanish. Right now, Hispanic is nothing but a white person speaking Spanish. And they're coming here getting benefits over you that should have been going to you. In this city, all these benefits they're getting for running for office, all these programs and everything, all this help that should have been going to blacks in the city of Los Angeles are going to them. They're getting it because you don't raise hell about it. You don't make an issue out of it. They're not entitled to those benefits, and it's illegal and unconstitutional. Because you go back to the 13th Amendment, it says spe very specifically, that black folks must be treated in all manners similar to the way white folk are treated or the white man is treated. Now, you would not be, saying, you're not being treated as whites. You're being treated when they come in and dominate over you. The Slaughterhouse case in 1872 said the same thing when whites down in Louisiana tried to use the 14th Amendment. And the court says that you cannot, whites cannot use the 14th Amendment. Hispanics are whites. 
They can't come in and say they're looking for due process. They want equal protection. They want affirmative action. You can't do it because this fort, the slaughterhouse case said it was illegal for anything but black folk. It's anything. It's illegal. I don't see any blacks raising cane about it. If you're going to march and demonstrate, that's what you should be raising cane about. How is it all the things that were set aside for you is going to everybody else? You're sitting there sleeping. And see, and the immigrants are coming in this country to take you over. That's why when, and all the progress that blacks got from the civil rights movement in the 1960s. In 19, let me give you a better example there. Let's go back to the 1950s. In 1950, a black man with a high school education, I mean, with a black man with a college education could not earn as much or you only can earn 50% of what a white high school dropout could earn. That's in 1950. By 1955, and by 1955, the employment, the income of a black person moved up 10% during the black civil rights movement. You moved up from 55% to 65%. By 1965, black people had picked up 10, 10 points from 55% to 65%. Then by 1970, when the, when the Hispanics got classified as minorities and started getting into the affirmative action program, along with the Asians and the Eskimos and Filipinos and Samoans and American Indians and, every, and everybody, Koreans and Chinese and Japanese, everybody, guess what happened? Black folks slid back. You're back now to where you were in 1950 in the income ratio. You went backwards. They took it from you. They're going to take over all the jobs and management jobs. They got special pressure programs in Washington where black folk demonstrated and raised cane up until the 1960s just to get federal jobs. Now, guess what? The federal government going out soliciting, bringing the Hispanics and giving them equal job opportunities. All the things that you fought for to get, they get it free. Now, what we're going to do now is to understand this concept. Then we're going into power numbers. Power numbers says we're now going to go for, for something that Anderson is pushing us towards. Power numbers. To power up for power numbers. Now, here's the way the system works. You got it. You build your communities, black community business communities, and the first thing you always focus on in your communities is economics. Economics. It is a five-story building in power numbers concept. So you, I put it in a concept where you can always remember this when I'm gone. So you'll never forget it. The first floor is always economics, because racism is economics. Racism has nothing in the world to do with who you like or who you don't like. It has nothing to do with it. And only when they beat up on you now because they know you don't have any economics. You don't have a basis beneath you. When they drag and shooting black folk, they're not shooting you because you're black. They're shooting you because of your social economic condition. You're powerless. They know the only thing you're going to do, they shoot 20 blacks tomorrow. The only thing you're going to do is go out and march. That's all you're going to do. They know that. You have no power and wealth. You build that business community and you build factories and industries in there. And you produce wealth and money and income. Then you take that wealth and money and income and you use it to benefit and lift your people. And you use it also to take the surplus capital and you go to the second floor in that five-story building. On the second floor in that five-story building, that's politics. That's politics. That's where your politicians are. Quit letting people mislead you about voting. Voting ain't worth a damn if you don't have an economy. I have run political campaigns for presidents, for governors, for attorney generals, for congressional people, for city, for, for mayors, and city council people. Politic, voting and politics ain't worth a quarter in voting if you don't have an economy. Right. It's money that controls your politics. Right. You take your money on that first floor in the power economics concepts that I'm trying to get you all to buy into. You, get, you, you, you take that money off the first floor, you buy every politician on the second floor. Don't worry about voting, buy them. <laughs> be just like the mafia. Be like the mafia. Just buy them. If you can't, you don't have enough money to buy them, then rent or lease them for a while. <laughs> you rent and lease them. Then you commission him and say, now on this second floor, now that I bought you, just like all these, this next election, you can see all this money going into all these candidates, billions and millions of dollars. They're buying those politicians. You buy them on the second floor. And then you tell them on the second floor, now that under the power of principles, I bought your re in you now take your re in to the third floor. And on the third floor, that's your court system. I don't care whether it's the Supreme Court or the local superior courts or county courts or city courts or state courts. And you buy them. And you, tell the and you tell them on that second floor in the court system, 
I, here's, you start taking care of my people and doing right. The courts control the police department. The third floor is the courts and the police department. The police department would not be killing your people and shoot them down if they knew that you had an economy underneath you. They're going to pull in. You, how many of you seen police shooting down Jews, for instance, running? How many times have they been shooting down Asians? How many times you see them hurting shooting down American Indians? Uh, uh, they, uh, they only shoot down black folk. You don't have an economy to dictate to the police department or to the court system. Then once you dictate to them, you take that money off the, off the first floor, you go to the fourth floor. Your fourth floor is your media. You all got to start producing media in these communities and take that money and start going into buying media. You got about 12,000 radio stations in the United States, about 12,000 cable systems in the United States, about 5,000 daily newspapers in the United States, and about 5,000 also, uh, 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 what did I miss, television stations. You own nothing. Out of 12,000 radio stations, you probably now own about 60 or 70. Out of cable system, you don't own any, one, not one. Television station, you used to own one out of 5,000. Daily newspaper, you don't own anything, not one daily newspaper. How in the world can you communicate? How in the world can you mobilize your people when you don't own the media to get in touch with them and tell them what to do? If you right now try to pr promote something for black folk, most media will not even carry it. Most co white corporations won't even buy tickets or ads to help you do it. If you have a black radio station, you cannot have black media unless you got black businesses because you need the advertising dollars to keep the business, keep the radio station, the media going. Then people say, why can't we own some radio? Because you don't have any businesses to buy the ads. Whites are not going to buy it. But now, but you, get, you can get white racists on TV and on the radio. You can get the Rush Limbaugh's or the, or the Hannity's or the or O'Reilly's on the Fox Channel. That whole Fox Channel is loaded down with racists. But they, but they get the advertising dollars to stay on the air. You know why? Because you give them the money. I don't see any black folk in America renegotiating their relationships. When did you re renegotiate your relationship with white corporations? Saying that if I see you supporting the Fox Channel on this negative stuff about black folk, you'll never get another dollar out of the black America. You won't do it. You should be doing it. Y'all should be sending letters all, every chance you get and calling on the black state and say, any, any white person on any of the Fox Channel out here saying something that implies or suggests or intimate that black folk are stupid, lazy, and dumb, and criminal, we will shut off every dollar coming into your company. They, you don't, they're not scared of you. They got your money for granted. They know they're going to get your dollar because they know you don't have any businesses to buy from. You don't have any alternative places to go get your gasoline, like in Detroit, Michigan, when the Arabs took over 144 out of 146 gas stations. You don't own and control anything. You're dependent on them. They say, we ain't worried about them black folk. They don't have any choice but to come give us their money. We'll kick their butts and they still got to give us their money. And the same thing is true with politics. The Republican Party don't need you. They know they got you locked in box. They know you're going to belong to the Democratic Party. Democratic Party said, we got you locked in box. We don't need you either. Because you see, my people, your leadership has not got enough intellectual gratuity and internal fortitude and common sense to say, hey, let's not support either one of the parties. Right. Let's create... You all could be the most powerful people in this nation within one or two years if you did one single thing. If you withdrew publicly from the Democratic Party and the Republican Party and said, we don't need either one of you. We're going to create a black independent party. And in that black independent party, we're going to trick you all because we're not going to run any candidates. I wouldn't run any candidates. I would create me a black independent party. I wouldn't run not one candidate. But I would say this. We're going to vote as a block. You're going to get 43 million black votes. And we will deliver that 43 million black votes to whoever promises most and delivers the most to black folk. Yeah. Right. We, don't care, we don't care what political party you belong to. You can be, and we don't care wh whether you're a black person, a white candidate, a pink candidate, a yellow candidate, or just an outright sambo. We don't care. 
we will vote for anybody who would deliver us and, and promise the most to black folk. That's the way you play politics. And I guarantee you, from all my years in running campaigns, every politician would knock down anything to get to your door. He said, you know what? If I deliver something to black folk, I can pick up 43 million black votes. Hell, I don't, I don't need a lot of people. I don't need it. I'll be there. Even though Hispanics have bypassed you in population, they might have about 43 or 45 million Hispanics in the United States, their turnout rate is only 20 percent. You still got them beat. Hispanics might have picked up the population, but they don't have the voting capacity yet. You can deliver and become a powerful, the most powerful people in this country if you started voting as an independent bloc. It said we move as a group. We move as a fist rather than fingers. And we'll stay together and we'll take care of each other, we'll buy from each other, we'll support each other, and we'll look after each other. And we'll make our dollars bounce in our community on that first floor. We'll make it circulate eight to 12 times before it leaves black hands. Hispanic money in America bounces six to seven times in the Hispanic community all over LA. <clears throat> White money bounces eight to 12 times. Asian and Arab money bounces 13 to 14 times. <clears throat> Jewish money bounces 18 times. Right now, black money doesn't bounce once because you're committing economic, social economic suicide. You can be the most powerful people if you learn how to organize and play as a team. Now, doing that, now here's, now, now let's, now the last floor, then I, the other part. Last floor is the fifth floor. The fifth floor is education. Don't keep going around telling black folk that our, our future rests in education. It is not. Education is about as useless as the black vote. It's about as useless and as wasted as a black vote if you don't have what? An economy. You can educate these black kids. They have no place to go and use them. Education is a tool just like a hammer and a saw. I got all kind of black kids graduating from school every year with all kind of degrees, master's degrees in this, master's degrees in that, and they can't master a damn thing because they ain't no place to go. Whites don't need them in their business and don't want them. So you're educating your kids to, to get an education and leave your community, go to somebody else's community, look for somebody else's business, work in somebody else's job, producing the wealth, power, and resources. What's the difference between that and a slave? You're still in the same spot. You should be saying, go off and get an education and come back home to our community and build things for us. And rather than going out looking for jobs, make your organizations, both whether religious or civil, make and make your politicians teach black folk how to produce jobs, not look for jobs. And we're doing that now by going to the last point, is that's called exceptionality. We do that by telling everybody, tell all your politicians from this day forward, we heard Dr. Anderson speak. And what he says from now on is that we're not going to play the game anymore. We're going to stop doing what we've been doing in terms of inappropriate behavior. We're not against anybody. I don't want you all to hate anybody. I don't want you all to be against Hispanics, Arabs, Asians, midgets, humpbacks, anybody else. Just strictly be for your own people. Okay? <clears throat> Racism is a team sport. You either play as a team or you lose by default. And whether you like it or not, God has arbitrarily assigned each and every one of you to a skin color team. That's right. God sent you here black. Your mom and daddy brought you here black. You better learn how to play as a black team or you're going to go down. And so I want you to learn how to play a team. And so what I want you to do is now is focus on this. I keep hearing the President of the United States talk about exceptionality. In the last month, he's talking about, we are an exceptional nation. We are this. We are an exceptional people. Blah, blah, blah. I heard the, um, right now, the Gallup poll reports that eight out of ten people in the United States believes firmly that the United States is an exceptional nation. Most of the nations in the world, out of 100, over 180 of them, believe that the United States is an exceptional nation. Now, what do they mean by exceptional and exceptionality? They're saying this, that because the United States has a certain kind of principles and values and precepts in it, that that makes them different and that they're entitled to certain treatment, certain respect, certain accords and certain dignities because of what our principles are what we call democracy, because our principles in immigration, because our principles in, in immigrants coming into the country. 
because our principle in human values. Therefore, the United States will be a special nation. They're entitled to privileges. That's why they run all over the world trying to be a superpower nation, getting involved in everybody's business around the world, going to every country and trying to set values about what they should do and what they should not do, it, saying that we as Americans are the exceptional nation on earth. We are the special nation. Therefore, we're entitled to have certain privileges and certain rights and certain dignities that you should be proud of. Now, the president and all the politicians saying that, I want you all to do this. You have to understand that you are a nation within a nation. You are an exception within an exception. Black people in America are an exceptional people. And all these years that I can count in doing research, black folk have been running away from their exceptionality now for 500 years. You've been doing what is downright stupid in terms of behavior. We've been doing stupid stuff running away from our exceptionalism. We are exceptional people. There are no people on earth, there are no people on earth like black folks. That's right. That's right. You are totally different from everybody. <laughs> totally different. Quit trying to be like everybody else. Quit going around claiming things that don't make any sense. But we want, well, what we want is uh, to be loved and accepted by the other groups. No, they should be trying to be loved and accepted by you. That's right. You're doing it in reverse. Understand again about that you live in a competitive society about race. And to my people, talk about, well, we, we, it's, a, it's a, their race against me. Quit looking for equality. If it's a race-based society, you cannot get equal opportunity. Nobody with more than a third grade education would be looking for equality in a race-based society. It makes no sense. Why would you be out looking for equal opportunity in a race-based society? Nobody's going to give you any equal opportunity in a race-based society. I'm sick and tired personally of hearing civil rights leaders talking about what we want is an equal opportunity. Nobody's giving that to you. What's the point of a race? A race is a contest. It is not designed to say, let's all play, but let's all come across the finish line at the same time. A point of a race is to separate what? Winners from losers. To guess who comes in in first place, second place, or third place, you either win, show, or place. And yet we keep talking about as black folk about equality, equal opportunity. You got to say, no, from now on we're running this race to win. We don't care who comes in second or who comes in third, we're going to try to come in first. You're in competition based on what? On things that you got that you can control, your exceptionality. We are exceptional people. And we are entitled to certain dignities and respects and honors. And let me run through these things and tell you very quickly what you should be doing. That you are totally different. And for this reason, don't let anybody put you in, in broad, ambiguous categories like they did in the Constitution by saying those people, that unhappy lot, those who are indebted, those who are abundant. Forget that crap. You can only have one original. When I hear people now talking about, well, we got Native Americans. No, they are not Native Americans. <clears throat> If black people were the first people on the earth, how did Indians get to be the native people? What happened was the blacks in Africa migrated out. The Folsom people had been here long before Asians got here. Asians crossed the Bering Straits like about five or 6,000 years ago. The Folsom people came about 15 or 16,000 years ago. They interbred with the Folsom people. That's why you have a Folsom, Arizona, Folsom Prison, Folsom, Colorado, and Folsom. That's why you came for all that Folsomness. That's from black people from Africa that are already here. So they, what's called American Indians are not the native people. They're not the first people. The first people in America were black folk. The first Jews in the, in the, in the world were black people. At some point, your exceptionality should be brought up and should be dignified that you were the first in all these things. You were the first people. You were the first Jews. You were the first human beings on earth. You are different. Now, if, if the United States can, can, can get different respect and privileges because of its exceptionality and its differentness, why don't black folk say our exceptionality is that we are different from all these groups you're trying to put us into? We're different from all those so-called minorities. We're different from all those so-called people of color. We're different from multicultural diversity because we are the only people that came to this country and were classified as three-fifths of a human being. You didn't classify anybody else as three-fifths of a human being. You did all those other, those immigrants that came to America, you didn't classify them as property. You only classified us as property. So how can you let somebody put you in a bag with all these other groups when they don't have the experiences you have and have been treated the way you've been treated? 
When, when, in this country, when black folk were, when, when they, when they, when that black folk got here, they were the only people that were treated as the slaves, not all the other people that came here as immigrants. In terms of exceptionality, again, black folk are different in the way how they've been treated versus how women were treated, and minorities and other and handicapped people were treated. Nobody else was denied an education but black folk. Every state, every level of government passed laws and it cost you $100 and 39 lashes with a whip to be caught teaching a black person to read and write. How can you sit there every day and let the politicians keep putting you in these bags about multicultural diversity, poor people, and minorities and all this kind of stuff when they were not treated like you were treated? You were the only person that were denied an education. So when white folks started talking about how dumb black folk are, they are supposed to be dumb. If you deny people an education for almost 500 years, they say, well, they're dumb. You did a good job. <laughs> You're supposed to say, no, why are you putting me in the bag with, with all these other groups when you treated me differently? That's my exceptionalism. I was exceptional. I should be getting some prize or some kind of dignity or privileges or rights be lifted up because of the way you treated me. Why is it when all these other people came to the country? Every white person came here as an immigrant, was entirely metered to 160 acres of free land. He could get 160 acres of free land immediately or 620 in a certain circumstances, free acres of land when a black person couldn't get one acre of land. And every acre that whites got was kept in their family. And that's why you had the Oklahoma rush in the 1860s, I mean the 1880s, when they opened up the Oklahoma Territory and immigrants poured into America. And in 24 hour periods, they picked up over two million acres of free land in 24 hours. Whites picked, immigrants picked up over two million acres of free land in a 24-hour period. All that land was passed on to their children. And each generation, it doubled or tripled in value and cost. That's why out west, when you go out west, all these, these whites have got these large farms, 50, 30,000 acres of farms and ranches. They have all this land. Blacks have nothing. It was passed on for one generation. got wealth and power behind it. How can you let them sit people, let them get all those privileges and you got to say, well, we're just all minorities. You got to be stuck on something other than stupid. <laughs> just sit there and let people put you in a bag with people who've never had your experiences. You've been treated differently all through history in every respect. You were the only people denied education. How is it in, in this country that black folk were the only people, the only people that we had a constitution written for them? which was the second constitution. They didn't write that for whites, they wrote it for black folk. That was different. They didn't write a const second constitution for gays and women and minorities. They wrote it for black folk. The 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment, the 13th Amendment, and the civil rights law was written for black folk. You were different. Why do you let people keep comparing you with other groups and denying you resources? Then the Supreme Court comes back and says, we can't do anything for you black folk based on color. Yes, you are supposed to. You're supposed to lift these black folk up. You're denying them the things they're entitled to. They're entitled to some respect and dignity. You've been mistreating them all these since for 500 years and say, we're not going to do anything for them. They're no different from a Hispanic that ran across the border last night. That is criminal, is immoral, and is illegal. And I can't find any black leaders in the country that understand that, to say, no, we ain't going for it. The black folk are not going for that. You are the only people in this nation that has fought in every war for this country. You're the only people that's fought for it. <clears throat> the only people that's fought in every war and whose mother country has never gone to war against her country. There's nobody else in this country can make that claim except black folk. You're the only people that fought in every war and whose mother country has never gone to war against this country. And they're direct descendants of slaves. 98%, that means that 98% of you all we're here before 98% of all the other people in America ever came. <clears throat> you are the oldest people in the nation. Why aren't you being respected as being the oldest general people in the nation? And that you're not guests. Why would you let people treat you as guests in America? Immigrants are the guests. They turn everything upside down against you. <clears throat> Where black folk are treated as guests in this nation. When in fact they're the only non-guest. Every white is a guest. Every Arab, every Asian, every Puerto Rican, every, they're a guest. 
And so what you should be saying is that, that we are not guests in America. You walk on sacred ground, paid for by the blood, sweat, and tears, the suffering and sacrificing of me and the black cotton pickers, slaves, cooks, butter, waiters, janitors. You are entitled to some dignity and respect and not to let people treat you as guests and say, we are the most patriotic people in this society. Lift yourself up and say, we are special people. And don't let anybody else compare you with anybody else. Black people founded the country. And then tell, tell the entire world <clears throat> that you all have to use your creative imagination, whites, Asian, Arabs, and Hispanics. Use your creative imagination and imagine this. What would this country be like <clears throat> if black folk had not been slaves in this country? What would this country be like if black folk had had a chance to have voted from the founding of the country? What would this country be like if black folk had been allowed to participate in writing of the United States constitutions? What would this country be like if black folk had gotten all those hundreds of thousands of millions of acres of free land and passed it on from generation to generation? What would black folk be like in this country if black folk had owned it, had enough money <clears throat> to handle that land that was given to the railroads and to the ranchers? What would this country be like if black folk had been treated with their special exceptionality? you have a whole different way of looking at things in this country because you are the backbone of the country. You're always the backbone. But because of the debris, the misleading, the sellouts, and, this, and what they call political correctness, and the political correctness is what you're under now. Political correctness that came into existence in the 1970s under the policies of benign neglect, which says take the, kill off the black civil rights movement and the black power movement by taking the focus off of black folk and shifting it to women, minority, and immigrants Political correctness means make black folk disappear, make them invisible, make them never be seen again. Anytime you hear anybody talking about political correctness, it means pretend that black people don't exist anymore. And don't sit there and take those butt whippings. They want to know why you're not progressing in America. You're, prog you're not progressing because you're not doing the kind of things you're supposed to be doing. You're exercising inappropriate behavior. And consequently, if things move out well for what we plan on doing, by the end of this year, we're going to have a big movement. We're going to start building some black communities in America. And I'm going to need each and every one of you to participate. And through the Harvest Institute, we're going to be raising capital to make loans and to build, and for black folk to build these businesses. And so, 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 <laughs> so count on that. And stay close to, to, to my friends here, like Rosie Milligan. We're going, to be, we're going to be asking certain blacks in the country to put up about almost $500 each. We're going to identify a certain number of people, and it'll be donated to the Harvest Institute, a nonprofit tax exempt corporation. And we're going to raise that capital, and we're going to have a whole pool of capital in Washington, D.C. We're going to build black communities, and we're going to subsidize our, our communities through that capital we're going to raise on long term revolving loan funds at 2% interest rate. You're going to build this country for black folks. <laughs> And you're going to be hearing about it later on. We're going to have a big major convention about it. And like I said, we've got a bunch of churches now all across America that are lining up. And, uh, and, we, and I, I, right now, we're looking at maybe about somewhere around 1,500, 2,000 black churches already across America. And we're going to raise this capital. And you're all going to be special people. And you're going to get out of this ditch. If you don't, I'm coming down in that ditch with a barbed wire switch. I'm going to beat the <laughs> hell out of every black in there. <laughs> <laughs> And one way or the other, I'm going to run your butts out of the ditch, okay? Get out of the ditch, and I love you all, and they want me to sit down and shut up. Okay, take care. Thank you.